Hello, and welcome to the Miami Cybersecurity Summit Ransomware and Resiliency Panel. Thanks for joining us today. I have with me, well, about seven extremely knowledgeable panelists who are going to tell us all about ransomware and resiliency, how you can hopefully prevent from getting any ransomware yourself. And well, as we always do, if we can't figure it out, we will rely on each other and poll for the answer. So to get started with, I am from the Cybercrime Support Network. I am the VP of Cyber Resiliency Services. We are focused on providing services to individuals and small businesses impacted by cybercrime. We're going to do a quick round robin to let everybody introduce themselves, and we'll go from there. So Chris, I'm going to start with you. Hey, everyone. My name is uh, Chris Bame. I am a cyber, um, well, I'm, I'm a, a technology strategist, I guess is the right terminology for my title. And uh, I'm working for Sentinel One. Uh, I've been in cybersecurity for over five, you know, 10 plus years now. Um, and I, I find it very passionate. I'm, I'm a, a geek at home, so. Perfect. And I think we all may be geeks at home on that yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Michael, you're up. Thank you, Stacey. Happy to be here. Uh, Michael Gorelick, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Morphosec. Um, well, have a cyber, uh, cyber experience for almost 20 years, but officially uh, just a bit more than uh, 12, 13 years uh, in companies, right? Okay, and Crane. Yep. Yeah, so, hey, how's it going? My name is Crane Hasselt. I'm the Director of Threat Intelligence at Abnormal Security. Um, been in the intelligence space for about 18 years. Uh, 11 of those years I spent at the FBI, where I helped create the uh, FBI Cyber Behavioral Analysis Center, and then moved out to the private sector in 2015, uh, helped build out a few cyber threat intel teams, um, and now at Enormous Security, we're focused on uh, various email-based threats and understanding those threats to help protect our customers. Perfect. Great. And Tony. Hi, everyone. Tony Lee here. I've got about 18 years in the security industry. I'm currently VP of Professional Services at uh, BlackBerry. So globally, we're comprised of hundreds of people spread over uh, eight business units. It spans anything from incident response and red team to guard uh, XDR. And, um, you know, we're directly on the front lines helping customers defend and respond against malware and, and ransomware. Uh, and other threats. So I'm looking forward to sharing some of that experience with the audience. Perfect. I think it will be really helpful. Alan, you're up. I, I'm disappointed nobody's made a Magnificent Seven joke yet. Like we should all put on cowboy hats and go save a small town from a ransomware attack uh, kind of thing. Um, but I'm Alan Liska. I'm an intelligence analyst and ransomware researcher at Recorded Future. I'm also the author of the book, Ransomware, Understand, Prevent, and Recover. Great. Glad to have you here. And Phil. I am Phil Owens, and I'm with uh, Stamus Networks. I've been in cybersecurity now for longer than everyone else before me. Um, so uh, I'm starting to feel my age on the call. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, I'm a director of systems engineering at, uh, at Stamus Networks. We do uh, network detection and response. Uh, so you might be wondering what's a network detection and response, people talking about ransomware. But we have some things to say. So um, look forward to uh, imparting some knowledge. Perfect. And I don't know if it helps, but so far I've been in cybersecurity longer than everyone else on the call too. So I'm right there with you on feeling my age. <laughs> and Jay, you are last but not least. All right. So I hope that doesn't make me the oldest one in the group, but um, I've been in the industry for about a little over 30 years now. Um, first 28 or so of those uh, actually doing um, IT security consulting and training, primarily for the federal government. And uh, for the last couple of years, a uh, little bit of an overlap in there, but I've been working for some lane for about four and a half years now, which is a security orchestration automation response company. And so my title there is the SOAR evangelist. So trying to make everybody aware of what you can do with automation and uh, why you might want to consider it. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Really looking forward to the conversation today. Michael, I'm going to start this first question off to you. 
where or how are companies most vulnerable to a ransomware attack? Thank you, Stacey. It's, uh, it's a great question. You know, at Morpheus, like we're dealing with uh, uh, at least three breaches per week, and uh, many of them are ransomware related, um, whether it's healthcare, whether it's manufacturing. Everyone are a target today. Everyone that have uh, IP or money, um, you know, attackers are very much sophisticated. They do their own reconnaissance of the business. They have their own, uh, you know, ransomware as a service. So um, essentially, everyone are a target. The weaker you have security posture, the more vulnerable you are. Attackers will use the easier targets, um, and they will, uh, you know, uh, target the the ones that really have a lot to lose. Uh, so definitely, hopefully we will talk about the advance of ransomware, but everyone are a target. I think that's really key. Everyone is a target, truly. All right, Jay, what would you add? So I, I think for the first thing that came to mind when I, when I saw the question is, you know, how are we most vulnerable? And I think probably everybody would agree that we are always going to be most vulnerable at the weakest link, which is always going to be the human. So uh, if we do not have the training in place and the testing programs in place where we are doing something to evaluate that, that is always going to be that weakest link. I mean, obviously we have concerns over patching systems and how are the networks set up? Have we segmented things properly? Do we have our backups? All of those are good. Uh, but you know, from my mind, one of the biggest things that we see over and over again is how easily you can send a phishing email to somebody and get them to click and do something, how easily you can do a road apple, leave out a USB drive, whatever the technique is. And unfortunately, if you don't keep up with that element, I think that's going to continue to be just an easy way in. Definitely. Okay, Crane. Yeah, so I think, you know, when you look at ransomware, you know, almost exclusively, it's a financially motivated attack, um, with the exception, with the rare exception of something like WannaCry or NotPedia. And because it's financially motivated, it's going to be, you know, essentially anyone who has access to money is a target of one of these attacks. Um, you know, it's in a lot of the research that, that my team has done looking at ransomware victims, you know, they're scattered all across the world. You know, over the past two years, 100, 110 different countries is where all, all these, uh, all these uh, targets were located. Um, doesn't even matter how big the, the business is. Even I think one of the biggest uh, you know, misconceptions about ransomware victims is that they're usually going to be large targets. When in reality, a majority of the majority of ransomware victims are actually smaller businesses that make less than fifty million dollars a year, right? So um, and so really, the the cyber criminals at the end of the day, the actors behind ransomware attacks, are just trying to get that initial foothold into a network that's going to allow them to exploit that access to make money at the end of the day, regardless of whether the uh, the victim can pay them a million dollars, $10,000. It doesn't really matter as long as they're making money because that's what, that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Absolutely. I know from my perspective, I've seen a lot of small businesses hit. They just perhaps don't make the news as much as the big ones. How about you, Alan? Yeah. So. You know, what's interesting over the last couple of years is as there's been this explosion in ransomware. And, and, and I know if we had had this same conversation in 2019, I would have said the same thing about an explosion of ransomware and in 2017 and in 2016. So we, but the explosion just keeps happening. Um, uh, but, but really because it, ransomware has gotten so big and there are all of these cottage industries that have sprung up in support of ransomware specifically, the diversity of initial access factors has really started to grow. So it's not just phishing. It's not just credential reuse. They're actually exploiting. Uh, last year, we cataloged over 50 vulnerabilities exploited by ransomware actors just for initial access. Third-party access is now becoming a common tactic going after your MSSP or your, your technology partners and using them as a means to get in. So uh, unfortunately, the, the, the initial access vectors are very diverse. And, and as a defender, you have to defend against all of those. And I mean, even now we're starting to see ransomware actors so far, not successfully, but really looking at that insider threat. Hey, if I give you $20,000, Will you go to a link and, and download that? We're not seeing a lot of that. I mean, there was the famous case in Tesla, uh, you know, against Tesla last year that obviously didn't happen. But we do see lapsus and we do see 
uh, Lockbit, you know, openly advertising, hey, um, if you're disgruntled with your company, come talk to us and we'll give you money. Um, and I know some people on the panel probably debate whether or not Lapsus is a ransomware group, but that's a whole other discussion that would take a whole other 45 <laughs> minutes to have. And probably not a good one to get into today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, Chris, do you want to wrap up with anything? Yeah, I just want to, everyone brought up great points. So I want to say the same thing. Like the main problem is everyone is in a, a, at point. Like it doesn't matter who you are, what organization you're at, you're going to be a potential vulnerable to ransomware. That's why having strong security, having great uh, foundations, understanding your platform, even looking at what we're going to talk about more around zero trust uh, framework will really help drive the prevention of having ransomware in your organization. So uh, I, I don't want to say the same thing five times. So I want to definitely agree that with everyone else there, it doesn't matter who you are, what organization you're with, you're vulnerable. Uh, at least you have the capability of being attacked and dealing with a ransomware attack. So uh, I, I agree with what everyone said. So I'll keep mine sweet and short. <laughs> okay, sometimes it's tough being last. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> All right, so Phil, I'm going to move on to you for this next question. How has ransomware and bad actors evolved over the past year? What kind of trends are you expecting to see in the future? I think uh, it's actually pretty interesting what was said earlier, right, with regards to, hey, ransomware is exploding. And I would say the same thing two years earlier and two years before that and two years before that, right, ransomware is exploding. And, and some of the things that I've seen in some of those explosions, right, are um, instead of just encrypt and request payment, we're starting to see the actors get more sophisticated, right, and do some lateral movement, look for crown jewels, if you will, within an organization, whether that's a small organization, and use that data after exfiltrating it to extort more money from a customer, right, if that's their intellectual property that might cause them to, uh, to really uh, um, hurt based off of that intellectual property being stolen uh, and, and posted publicly. So um, that's what I'm seeing, uh, a, lot, a lot less of the uh, old smash and grab, let's get in, let's encrypt as, what we can and see if we can get um, you know, 120, uh, 10,000 or $100 even, right? Just as many as yeah. I can, just get $100 in, in um, Bitcoin uh, to, hey, not only am I gonna take you up front and, give, and encrypt all your data, but I can also, uh, extort you for the uh, data that I've exfilled. Um, so that's what we've been seeing a lot of lately. Okay, absolutely, double extortion. And I have to ask, is it even possible to transfer only $100 in Bitcoin right now? Yes, yes it is. Um, <laughs> okay. I, 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 what are those Satoshis, little Satoshis or what they, they call them, I think? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Michael, what would you add? Yeah, so definitely I agree. You know, I remember in 2017, one of the employees got ransomware. It was like $1,000 for a single employee. You know, it was all about delivered automatically through some malware. It was isolated case to one specific computer. Then there were the trick bots, and then there were the manual access with the, you know, uh, cyber groups around, reminding us that uh, Russian perestroika in the 19th and the extortion came. And then the, you mentioned the extortion, double extortion, they call it. Every 11 seconds, a ransomware attack, 4 million impact. We track 500, uh, at least 500 companies a month uh, are being extorted. And I'm not even saying about the one that succeeded. This is only like collected and crawled from, uh, from the network. And then you have the triple extortion, right? They're calling your customer, your, your, your uh, providers and then uh, shaming you. So all this is like this evolved to a very, very sophisticated business model, I would say, that innovates all across, innovates in the um, laundry, money laundry, in the support channels, in the uh, development of the ransom itself, including uh, adaptation of defensive agent tactics, you know, living off the land. It's definitely a good business uh, to be in for the, for the attackers and definitely quite complicated for us as a defender to uh, protect against them. I think we, I, I do see the light at the end of the tunnel. I, I think we can definitely uh, make it harder for the attackers to uh, exploit with ransomware. I think there are a lot of people hoping that you are right. We can find a way to make it more difficult. All right. So, Jay, what are you seeing in terms of evolution over the past year or trends you're expecting to see in the future? I think one of the things that um, really kind of ties into what we we're saying a little bit in that last question is, 
you know, who, who are the targets? Are they always going to be the, the bigger targets that have a lot of money? Not necessarily. You know, the, these attackers, they're not stupid. They're looking for what is going to be the easiest way to get in that door. So in many cases, just having access or looking for those smaller targets could be exactly what they're looking for. Not because that's going to be where they're going to get their money or do their extortion, but because that smaller one might be a contractor that deals with a larger organization. That might be how they're going to get the foot in the door. So I, I think we're going to see some evolution in the creativeness of those attacks, meaning not, not just, you know, spew it out there and see you know what happens where does it land but definitely some more targeted types of attacks and um and we're already seeing things like the the attackers using automation and providing you know ransomware as a service and so on and that will continue i mean again for any of us the more we can do without having to have our hands on it and have the systems do it for us the easier it is to make that money so i, I think we're going to see more and more of that okay although you I will say you're scaring me a little bit with that prediction. Well, Sorry. I'd like to say it wasn't true, but I, I mean, <laughs> let's face it, everything that we can think of to do, they can think of to do and vice versa, so. Absolutely. All right, so Tony, what would you add? Yeah, I would agree with everybody that the, the business model and the maturity of the threat actors is definitely improving. In fact, uh, we've also seen a rise in initial access brokers uh, using the dark web to sell access to an organization, uh, which is then used by another threat actor to steal data and deploy ransomware, like we were talking about earlier with the double extortion or the triple extortion. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the reasons why we've actually added a, a specific dark web search and monitoring service uh, to our offerings, because we, we're trying to um, you know, track what the trends are in the market, what the threat actors are doing, and then uh, help organizations combat that, that threat. And the, yeah. the actors um, that are selling access that's already gained uh, are part of this evolving ransomware as a service business model. And it's allowing criminals to scale uh, to attack even smaller and um, you know, smaller organizations. And sometimes that, that's actually preferred over the larger targets, right? That will attract un, unwanted attention. And the sad fact is nowadays, if, if you can pay a, a ransom, uh, you're a target, and that pretty much makes everybody a target. And uh, for future trends, I would say, it, un unfortunately, I don't think it's going anywhere uh, anytime soon. Uh, threat actors, they are coin operated. So if the coins are there for the taking, uh, they're not going anywhere. All righty. And Alan, what would you add? Yeah, I, you know, again, going last, you, you know, a lot of yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. Um, you know, I, I think following up on, on Phil and everybody else's point, that growth of that extortion ecosystem. Uh, I think more and more companies are getting better at backups and, and being able to restore from backups. So that extortion ecosystem has become such an important part of the ransomware actors model. Um, but the other thing, and we've seen this from the Conti leaks, um, you know, all of the data that pulled from the Conti leaks is not just how sophisticated the, the sort of the top tier ransomware groups are, but all the documentation that they had for sort of the, the new uh, affiliates that joined their ransomware as a service, all the manuals that they had that allowed them to very quickly get up to speed, you know, very specific instructions, go look here on Dun & Bradstreet for information about the company, um, run these specific commands. If you run into this problem, do this. So, you know, it's, it's not even, just that the top tier are uh, are more sophisticated. The bottom tier are getting more sophisticated just because that documentation is being shared, which I think is is kind of disturbing. So ransomware really is becoming a turnkey operation for uh, novice threat actors that want to get into it. But I do think one thing that hasn't been touched on that I think has been really important in the last year. Uh, in 2021, we saw more than 20 law enforcement actions against ransomware actors. That's more than in the previous four years combined. Um, so, and that's arrests, that is uh, taking money that was paid back, that's uh, sanctions against, uh, against cryptocurrency exchanges that are laundering money. Um, and it's not enough, obviously, because nobody here is saying, oh, great, ransomware is solved, we're, we're good to go. Um, but we have to start somewhere. And I think the fact that we have 30 countries now focusing um, their attention and more importantly, their intelligence services attention on ransomware groups 
is going to be a is going to be a big deal. I mean, you know, it's easy if I'm a ransomware actor to hide from you know a jackass like myself. It's much harder to hide from the NSA, from GCHQ, and intelligence services. And they're not subtle. Their opsec is poor. Um, so uh, you know, when you have 30 countries sharing information about where these actors are located, what you know, what's going on with them you're going to see more arrests in the future. And right now it's whack-a-mole, but as we start to make it more expensive to carry out and be, be a ransomware operator, at least outside of Russia, be a ransomware operator, um, uh, I think um, you know, that'll start to slow down because the, 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 the cost of engaging in the business will change. Gotcha, okay. And I think that's kind of a really important point. You called it a business as several people alluded to, it's a business model. These are folks who do this full-time, this is their day job. So we really have to remember there's a reason they're as sophisticated as us. That's because they go to work in the morning to put ransomware on our systems, on our networks. All right, so Chris, I'm gonna toss this question your way. Okay. Why and how is perimeter-based security and the trust but verify method becoming increasingly ineffective. How do businesses effectively shift from that to zero trust? Yeah, um, so in, a, in a, a trust by verify model, if you're unfamiliar with it, that's like giving you yourself a, a user account that has access into your network on a machine that you've authorized and then you can have access to everything on your network. You've trusted that person, they have access. So you've, uh, you've hired them. Zero trust is changing that approach. And why, why trust by verify is not very effective is our landscape's changing. We're moving to a more holistic set of attack vectors that data footprint, um, our corporate data footprint is changing toward. So you're having your bring your own device and you're having um, working from home. A lot of things are changing, especially with COVID uh, the, over the past few years. So moving toward uh, the zero trust establishes a multi-layer defense. And we kind of highlighted earlier during our conversation where it starts with identity and then it moves to a more of an endpoint device protection and ends to a data layer approach. Um, usually from a guidance perspective, there's a, there's a bunch of different ways we could probably talk about guidance around zero trust for probably for about 30 minutes. But uh, my personal suggestion is to use the CISA zero trust maturity model. It kind of helps a business understand where they're at in zero trust and how to shift aggressive, well, and, and their form and fashion in the, uh, toward a fully zero trust uh, environment. So that's my personal suggestion. Okay, thank you. Yeah. How about you, Phil? Even without uh, without trust in a zero trust model, right? You still need to verify activities of a user on the network, and um, you know zero trust is about segmenting and making sure that uh, users only have access to what they need to effectively do what they need to do, right? Um, and by doing that, it effectively makes the user the perimeter of the network, right? Um, which means that now instead of having um, a single uh, uh, perimeter where there's firewalls and you just let them in and they're in and can see everything with the trust but verify um, the zero trust you're you're asking all the time. However, it is still critical to keep monitoring those users for any anomalies. So the data layer that uh, that Chris just talked about, um, not just north south traffic but east west traffic that needs to be uh, taken uh, taken into consideration. Uh, so this monitoring is critical component to any zero trust implementation. So. Okay, thank you. And Tony. Sure thing. To add on to uh, Phil's comments about uh, the firewalls, I think that's a great point because uh, year, years ago, and we have enough experience on this panel uh, to remember this, but we focused on making the exterior of the network as hardened as possible. And we sort of neglected the inside of the network because we assumed trust. Uh, if you were inside the network, you know, you were a trusted person. But, but now, you know, we need to expect the perimeter breach uh, will occur, and then uh, we need to make it more difficult for attackers to achieve whatever goals they have uh, once they're inside. And uh, attacker goals, they can vary uh, to include anything from data exfil to launching the ransomware. Um, but in most cases, the threat actor needs to perform the same tactics or, or very similar tactics, right? And this includes escalating privileges and lateral movement uh, once they get those creds, uh, steal data, and then finally spread malware. And if we increase the difficulty of actually gaining the um, privileged access and the lateral movement, then we can um, decrease or lower the likelihood of a successful and widespread 
uh, ransomware attack. Uh, however, this does require us to kind of get rid of those old notions of, you know, just secure the perimeter and really move toward a zero trust model of uh, trust nothing and verify everything. It's not an easy uplift by any any means, uh, you know, as as much as everybody wants to sell you a silver bullet that's going to solve it, it's not a single product that's going to solve this thing. It, it, it's really people, process, technology, and a lot of effort. Elbow grease, yes. Oh, you bet. Yeah. All right, Phil, you're up this time. In addition to implementing wow, first zero. Twice. <laughs> In addition to implementing Zero Trust Framework, what other security measures can companies take to avoid ransomware attacks? Well, as I mentioned above, um, adding a network-based type of detection tool um, is what we've been seeing a lot of organizations move to, um, to, to keep an eye on the data layer and the things that are flowing uh, both north, south, east, west uh, on a network. Uh, there's so much that can be observed uh, with just throwing out a few, a few passive uh, listeners on the network, uh, whether that's on-prem or even in a cloud environment. And uh, because of these sensors, uh, they can be deployed passively, no real risk to um, network outages. And then uh, deployment being very easy, it doesn't require something on every single endpoint. Um, and this allows monitoring of devices that can't have agents and things like that deployed on them. So with that, um, don't get me wrong, I think that, uh, that um, everyone on this panel has has a solution that needs to be done. I, I come from the old time, like I mentioned earlier, right? I believe in defense in depth. I think endpoints, uh, identity tools, all of those things need to be put in place. Um, and that's especially when uh, zero trust is used, so. Okay, thank you. And Tony, what would you add? Yeah, again, uh, agreeing with Phil there, that um, sometimes it's about back to basics. Uh, but e even with a, you know, an effective zero trust model in place, uh, your defenses need to include uh, multiple layers, real time and around the clock monitoring. Uh, you know, all the defenses are designed to hopefully stop uh, the threat actor, um, but if it can't stop the threat actor, it should definitely slow them down, right? Uh, slow them down into making a little bit of noise, um, triggering some alarms. But if no one's paying attention to those alarms, this still poses a, a risk. And attackers, they're motivated. Um, they're gonna continue to knock at the door and you need to be ready to answer it. And um, unfortunately, we still see a fair amount of customers saying that, well, we just cover nine to five in our time zone, right? Um, and maybe we have pager duty, maybe we don't. Maybe we just wait till we come in the next morning and we figure out what, what kind of alerts came in overnight. I mean, that is scary. Uh, because attackers, they're global, they're going to work around the clock, and uh, all of our defenses have to do the same. Um, but, you know, a lot of organizations, especially SMB market, they just don't have the staff, um, they don't have the capabilities. Uh, so to those, uh, I would say, look into a managed service provider, um, you know, call up your trusted uh, security uh, consulting firm, ask them, you know, do they have anything that will help you with uh, 24 by 7 monitoring, right? Get away from the 95 stuff. Um, ask if they can help you implement automated rapid response or, uh, you know, continuous threat hunting. Um, incorporate threat intelligence into your security stack. These are things that are going to take you from a more reactive uh, security posture to a more proactive security posture. And, you know, a lot of these services actually can offer superior protection. Uh, at a fraction of the cost, because uh, just like the, the threat actors, um, these, these organizations actually do it for a living, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And they're also leveraging economies of scale that aren't available to individual organizations. Great. I, if I could, I'd throw in another couple of items. We alluded to earlier, both backups and making sure that when they're on your network, your backups are perhaps not on your network, having a secure copy offline. Uh, from personal experience, I'm gonna ask, test that copy. Please <laughs> test that copy and make sure it actually, you know how to reinstall from it and recover from it. Because I can't tell you how many times I see an instance where everybody thinks they're okay, they have backups and 
those backups haven't been working for months or years. The other thing that got mentioned a lot is some of the different techniques we're seeing that these actors are using, which you kind of alluded to with threat intelligence. I think one of the great ways to do that is to actually attend events like this. So a huge shout out to Cybersecurity Summit for giving us the chance to talk about what the actors are doing right now, which helps us all be a little bit more informed and prepared. All right. So moving on to our next question, and Michael, I'm circling back to you on this one. It's easier for large enterprises to implement zero trust and defend against ransomware, but how can smaller security teams with limited resources do so? Yeah, thank you. So I, I think, you know, we, we all kind of touched upon zero trust. We touched upon SMBs, we touched upon uh, how difficult it's uh, to implement. I think Tony mentioned how difficult it's to implement really never trust um, and also the, the issue of alert fatigue, etc. cetera. Um, so yes, zero trust is difficult. Uh, and essentially zero trust comes from the perimeter network. But you know, knowing that the new, uh, the new uh, let's say, the new perimeter is the endpoint, or the user uh, that uses this, uh, we have to think about zero trust all across the uh, attacks, the, the protection stack, which includes also the endpoints, the applications, and how do we implement zero trust really um, within on the place where the attacker gets in. So uh, uh, fortunately, Microsoft invested quite a lot uh, into implementing uh, some uh, hardening uh, capabilities into the OS for free. So. Uh, is and uh, smaller customers definitely can uh, leverage some of the uh, functionality that is given for free, uh, such as you know attack surface reduction um, uh, and and other uh, mechanisms of application control to definitely uh, close up the attack surface and by this kind of get to hey I, I don't trust this application to run I don't trust this uh, uh, someone to do anything. Um, uh, essentially, this needs to be complemented. The using of hardening tools together with obviously your other uh, detection tools, uh, you need preventive tools, especially with SMBs that and the, uh, that have this alert fatigue that don't necessarily know how to read those attacks or handle those attacks. They need preventive approaches. So, what are the different additional preventive approaches? Definitely, it's it's something that we, for example, do with moving target defense. Again, we are talking about attack surface reduction. How do you prevent it earlier? How do you not overflow with attacks? So thinking about advanced innovative technologies, thinks about preventive technology, deception is a big thing right now with the Gartner. Um, so th there are things to do definitely, but don't forget that zero trust is not only perimeter right now, it's the whole stack. Right? Really well thought out reply. Thank you for that. Okay, and Jay, I'm turning this one over to you too. All right, I, I have to say from your comment a moment ago, woman after my own heart, because one of the first answers is backups, backups, backups. And it's not, you know, like you said, the, the key thing that I have seen over and over and over in different organizations, large and small, is where they do the backups. And like you said, they're not, they're not practicing, they're not, they're not planning, they're not checking them to see, does it really work? Can they really restore? Does it really work? Uh, so, you know, with, with some of the smaller clients that I've worked with in, in my general area, I, I really do stress on two things. I mean, obviously, we're still going to look at all of the things that have been mentioned. Those are all excellent. But I'm, I'm usually trying to focus with the smaller groups on that initial vector. So training is one of the biggest things. And, and again, making sure people know, because if you don't tell somebody, hey, you might get a message that says, Here's your coupon. Click on it. <laughs> you know, and and if people haven't been told, no, don't. I mean, they just they don't use that common sense that we think everybody should have. And it's amazing how frequently those simple little things can occur. And if they've been trained, especially over and over again, how much more likely they are to maybe help us avoid that initial vector of attack. But then on the backside of it, let's say that you are infiltrated. Let's say that things do go awry you should be able to just wipe the whole thing and put it back together. I mean, if you've got it backed up to that level, fantastic. You've got that other side of it. But uh, the other thing I think is really big is 
uh, as a couple of people have already said, you know, there's a lot of good resources out there. Um, are what we're talking about today, whether it's a panel, whether it's guides produced by government agencies or others, you know, don't put your head in the sand. Um, look out there, be aware of what's going on. And again, whatever you come up with as your strategy, practice it. That, that's the key thing for me. Wonderful answer. Thank you. And definitely practice it. I will also say in terms of resources, there are enormous amounts of resources offered by varying companies out there for free because they understand this is such a problem and by government agencies. Because as someone earlier mentioned, government agencies around the world are recognizing this as a major threat. So they are producing their own resources that can help everybody respond to and hopefully prevent some of the ransomware attacks. All right, so one really important question, I would say this is the question that everybody asks, and I'm gonna turn this one over to you first, Chris. You're right. the victim of a ransomware attack. What options other than paying do you have? How do you mitigate the damage of the attack and recover afterwards? Uh, I'm gonna concentrate on the first part of the question, because uh, I don't want to spend too much on the mitigation part, but um, first off, don't panic. Um, that's, the, that's the first thing everyone does is they say, oh, oh uh, I've lost everything. Uh, if you can isolate the machine, I'm going to get to the technical part just a little bit. I would isolate the infection as much as you can, uh, discover if it's uh, if there's any persistence or anything else in your environment to lock it all down. I would identify the type of infection, and the reason is, as I'll uh, just mention in just a second, uh, big one, I think it's missed often. Um, it's getting better, though, with uh, cybersecurity insurance, is report it, like if IC3, or if you're familiar with Internet Crime uh, Complacent Center, same same uh, name, uh, definitely report it. That way they shared a knowledge around. And then before you mitigate, before you do anything on the mitigation part, you need to figure out your, your plan of attack. Like, like mentioned, if you already had one, it's fantastic. You can move forward with it. But it may be, unfortunately, just starting all over and accepting the loss, like just wiping the machine. That's unfortunately a, a common approach. Uh, clean up. If you have an endpoint protection or something on your machine that has the ability to uh, wind it back or get something, uh, remove it from, completely from your operating system or however you have it in your infrastructure, that's a, an option as well. And there is ransomware decryption. So there is some open source ransomware decryption software out there. Uh, that's why identifying the type, if you can, is key. Uh, working with a partner or your security team probably can help you identify that. And that might be your next step on understanding your next part of the conversation of mitigation. So I'll, uh, I'll let the next panelist mention that. Okay, absolutely. And if I could just emphasize, for those of us who come from a law enforcement background, I can't tell you how important it is to have those reports. Because if we don't have the reports from the first starting point, then we actually don't know how big the threat is, which makes it very hard to respond effectively to the threat. So reporting it goes a long ways, reporting it through the Internet Crime Complaint Center, IC3, through cert teams in whatever country you're in, all different types of ways to report it, but highly important to make sure that we can all work together to mitigate this threat as much as possible. And now I'm gonna get off my soapbox on that one and turn it over to Alan. Yeah, so, you know, I know the second part of the question is what are the alternatives to paying the ransom? Um, and, you know, the, the, the process is, is recovery. Um, uh, if, if you're not gonna pay, you, you have to go to recovery. So everything you said about making sure your backups work and, 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 you know, testing those on a regular basis, you know, um, when, when you're changing your batteries and your smoke alarm twice a year, go test your backups. Although ideally you'd want to do that more often than that. Um, the, you know, I think you need to understand that the, not you all, cause you all know, but I think victims need to understand that the, ransomware recovery process and this is whether you pay the ransom or don't pay the ransom is a marathon it's months of recovery um just to get back to basic functionality um and, and so uh uh getting all the systems rest you know get, getting first of all getting the malware out of your network right not just the ransomware but all of the tools the ransomware actor used all of the um 
uh, all, 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 you know, their, their method of initial access. You know, there's a stat, I think, actually from BlackBerry that said something like 80% of ransomware victims are re who pay the ransom are reinfected within a couple of months. Um, uh, so you, you can't just clear out the ransomware. You have to clear out all the artifacts associated with the attack. And then you can start the restoration process. And, and, and for uh, the rest of the olds here, you want to do it like the $6 million man. You want to build them better, stronger, faster. Um, so you know you don't want to just restore what you had before because that was part of the problem. So you need to use this opportunity for better network segmentation. You need to use this opportunity for making sure you've got a better you know, patch management program and asset management program in place and so on. So you really want to take advantage of that. And reach out to your insurance company immediately, because even if you don't play, plan on playing the ran, paying the ransom, your insurance company will likely have a ransomware negotiator in, uh, uh, available to you, and they can engage in activity with the, uh, with the, with the uh, ransomware actors. Find out what they stole. Find out what kind of information you can give. Even if, again, you have no intention of paying, at least keep them on the hook and maybe think they're going to get paid because uh, <laughs> if they have stolen data, it'll take them that much longer to release and definitely use a third party negotiator. I've seen too many victims go in to have that conversation with the ransomware actor. And when you go in and call them a useless bastard, it's not going to help them. You're not wrong, but it's not going to help the negotiation process. Um, it's going to get your data dumped a lot faster. Fair point. Okay. And Crane, what would you wrap up with? Yeah, I mean, so when it comes to when it comes to ransomware attacks, I think it, without a doubt, you know, like with mo other types of cyber attacks, the biggest thing to think about is that if you're deciding about how you're going to respond to a ransomware attack after a ransomware attack has happened, you're already in the deep end, right? So the biggest thing with ransomware is making sure you have an effective uh, an effective recovery plan, an effective response plan well ahead of any potential incident. So you know what the steps you're going to take are going to be. You know that you have those backups that could potentially be restored. You know, in addition to sort of getting the data back, getting access to the data back, the other side of it that is sort of we talked we talked about a little bit earlier is the other side of a lot of the tactics that these actors are using today, which is the double extortion and understanding that, you know, while I want to get access to my to my data back. So if I restore from backups, I can at least get access back, but I might lose data, potentially sensitive data as well. And while there are certain, uh, you know, certain components of that, that I think, you know, from a practical perspective of losing data does not make a lot of sense from the criminal's perspective. The fact that downloading terabytes of data from Tor is not very practical or easy, um, which is why it takes these guys sometimes months to upload everything to their dark web blogs. Um, and then if they host it on sort of some open file sharing service, those are usually taken down almost immediately. And so, but I think that calculus then now has to be factored into a decision to, to make a payment because you're going to have executives and board members be like, well, they have access to our data. We don't want this data to get out there. What do we do? And that's also why the, so the cyber criminals are doing this to begin with is because they want to increase that incentive to get organizations to pay. Um, but I think, you know, with, with ransomware, it all comes down to, you know, the basics, you know, making sure that you're prepared for these attacks. And so if, you know, if the off chance happens that your organization does become the victim of a ransomware attack, then you can respond to it effectively and mitigate your systems that have been impacted completely and not just become a duplicate or triplicate victim of another future ransomware attack. Yep. And don't start with panic. <laughs> don't start with panic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you all very much for your insight today. I know it's been a really great discussion and we are almost completely out of time at this point, but I think there are a lot of good points that I have heard and I hope our audience takes away as things they can do to help their systems, to prepare, to mitigate, to respond, whatever it takes when they hopefully never face ransomware in the first place. I do want to take a moment to ask our audience and encourage everyone to visit each of these speakers booths, whether you're in person or virtual at this conference. And that way you can have further conversations and learn about their company solutions. Thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks everyone.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.